There's a lot of buzz about microservices these days. Everybody wants to create applications using the microservice architecture. In this video, let's look at what microservices are really all about. But rather than reading out a, like, a list of architectural concepts, we will approach this from a completely different place by me telling you a story that you really need to know. Let's go back in time to the old days when we didn't have anything called microservices. In fact, we'll go so far back, we'll go to a time when a computer was big enough to fill the room. You must have seen pictures of one of these things. You would walk up to that computer, you would give it all the instructions it needs to compute, then it would take it and it would execute it. All right, fast forward a little bit to desktop machines. Again, programs resided on the desktop machine. The program or application contains all the instructions that are needed to execute. So when people would write applications for it, their code would be compiled down and the whole thing would be installed on the computer in one go. And it would be installed on the same computer. Think of purely desktop only apps, okay? Something like Microsoft Word or a text editor that you install on your machine. This has historically influenced how we write code. When we need to write an application, we would start a new code project and we would add functionality into that project. We need more functionality, add more code. And so the size of the code base for any given application keeps increasing over time. So what starts as a small code base might end up turning into a large complex code base over time. And people realized this. There were best practices that were created to handle large projects. Developers were recommended to break things up into modules. So rather than put all your code into a single mess of a code base, create smaller modules and compose your application from these modules. Small independent parts that were focused on just doing a small amount of functionality. These modules were supposed to be reusable. So a simple module could be added to another project to help another application. See, isn't this awesome? And then once you've created your application this way, you're ready to build this whole application and deploy this on the machine that runs your application. Notice something here. When coding your application, you have all these modular constructs, right? Nice fragmented organized pieces of functionality, pieces of code that compose together to form your application. But still, what you're doing is composing them to form one application. And when you build it and deploy it, all those small pieces all get smushed together into one giant ball of distributable that is your final application build. And that's what you deploy to a machine. Again, take the example of your text editor installer or Microsoft Word installer. No matter how the developers of that application have modularized and organized their source code, the final distributable, the final executable is just one thing with everything smushed together. This is important to remember, okay? Remember this picture. Nice, fancy, modularized, organized structure of the code, but one application, so the final deployed entity, smushed because nobody cares how the application looks on the user's machine, right? And everything needs to be deployed on to one machine anyway. This used to work for the most part for desktop applications. People would happily develop and deploy applications this way. And then, and then there came along two things that would revolutionize and maybe even necessitate some changes to the way we build applications. What were those two things? First was the onset of web applications. People started to move away from applications that needed to be installed on the machine and towards web applications that would be installed on a remote server machine somewhere on the internet. And then you from your machine can use your web browser to access the result of that execution on the remote machine. Think server-side applications. The server would prepare the HTML that your web application needs to show and no applications are actually deployed on your machine apart from your browser perhaps. You just use your browser. The actual application would be deployed on the server somewhere and your requests go to that thing and that processes it, does whatever it needs to do and then returns back a response. Now you might ask me, how does this change things? Well, for the most part, nothing much changed initially. 
The only change was instead of developers installing their applications on all the different users' machines, they would install them on just one server and all the users would just point to that server and access that server. This was awesome, right? Everybody gets automatic updates, very cool. But then the core and the deployment model was still the same. Nice, fancy, modularized, organized structure of the code, but all that composes to just one application and the final deployed entity smushed. Rather than deploying the smush on the user's machine, they were now deploying that smush in one place on the server. Then at some point of time, due to various different reasons, some people started wondering, hmm, there must be a better way. But wait, let's pause the story for a bit and let's look at one other development that's been happening to applications over the years. Turns out, web apps have been growing very, very incredibly, very complicated over time. The first web applications from the past did very simple rudimentary things. I don't know, like tell you the time or something, nothing too fancy. But over time, web applications have started becoming better, bigger, quicker, more complicated, bigger scale, bigger user base, bigger everything. And today we have web applications that can you know, find something from the whole internet in a matter of milliseconds or find what cabs are available around you all over the world uh, in milliseconds. These are incredible feats, if you think about it, and they need incredibly complicated code to be developed and deployed. And this complexity becomes harder and harder to maintain. Hang on, we have nice modular architecture on the code side of things. Isn't that enough to handle the complexity during development time? Who cares about how the application is deployed, right? Well, with the type of applications we are talking about, the complexity needs to be handled not just at the coding side of things, they also need to be handled at the runtime or execution side of things. Having a single thing that you deploy didn't work anymore. This way of having a single application was called the monolithic application or monolithic architecture. Mono means single, lithic means stone. It's a single stone, monolithic. This is the smush, basically. What are some of the disadvantages of this monolithic model? First, the bigger the deployment, the more challenging the deployment. Let me give you an example. Let's say you wanna push a new feature to your big monolithic application, all right? So among all the code commits that you wanna deploy is the single code commit by this new guy the company has just hired. You're not so sure about him. He probably doesn't know much and he's still learning. But his first code commit ever is just sitting there and you're worried, what do you do? Well, you need to test the whole thing before you deploy, the whole application. You never know which part of the application that commit might have broken. Well, I'm exaggerating here, of course, but the fact remains, since everything, since the whole application is being deployed every time, you need to test the whole application every time you deploy because anything in it could have a bug introduced. And yeah, you have automated tests and all that jazz, but it is a problem. Second problem with monolithic architectures, scalability. Here is an example. Online e-commerce sites, they have very unpredictable traffic spikes, right? So let's say there is a sale on some product. People rush to the site like crazy. And after the sale is over, the traffic slows down. Similarly, during holidays, there is a spike and there is a dip. Thankfully, these days, we have elastic servers. So when the traffic spikes up, the number of application server instances are increased, but then when the traffic goes back to normal, the extra servers are retired. That's great. But imagine an entire e-commerce website deployed as a single monolith. This monolith has shopping functionality, user profile, returns functionality, a whole lot of other stuff. Let's say there's a traffic spike on the shopping pages. When the servers scale up, notice that all the other functionalities should scale up as well, even though nobody's using them. They have to scale up because the whole thing is just one single application. So a big e-commerce site has to pay a lot more money to create these duplicate instances of the whole application when only a small portion of the app actually needs to be scaled up during the time of those spikes. There are a few other challenges, but I won't go into all of them now. Let's go back to the story, to that one guy who said, hmm, there must be a better way. So the idea is like this. Back when we were deploying to desktop machines, we had to install the whole app on a single machine. We didn't have a choice. But wait, now we have web applications. The applications actually reside on a server. The user who's sitting at home on their computer or phone 
they don't care where your application is or how you deployed or how you execute it. They just need one main entry point application to talk to. And from there on, you can run a single application on one machine or 10 applications on 10 machines. Nobody cares. So here's an idea. Rather than have the whole application smushed into one monolith and deployed into one machine, why not split the application into smaller mini applications? Then you can deploy these mini applications on different machines. You can have them talk to each other over the network and together work as the bigger application. Take for example, the e-commerce site. You could create a shopping catalog application that just has the shopping catalog functionality and you deploy it on a separate server. Your order processing is on another server. User profile application is on another server. And let's say when the user wants to see the shopping catalog, the view application, which is another application, makes a REST API call to the catalog application's API and say, hey, give me the list of products to show. And the API returns the list and then the view application returns an HTML with that list. So these mini applications talk to each other over the network by calling each other's REST APIs to get whatever they want from each other. Okay, well, how would this help? First, the risk of deployment is eased. Making a change to the shopping catalog application, well, it's a separate application. You can test and deploy just that. You don't have to test and deploy the rest of the application. Secondly, scaling, no problem. During the holidays, you scale up only the shopping catalog application. You'll be creating more server instances only for the mini applications that you need. So these mini applications or services are what are technically called microservices. Microservices are a way of breaking your application or service down into standalone independent applications that can be run on different hardware or server instances. They all talk to each other uh, over REST APIs and work together to provide the functionality of your application or product. So all that fancy organization that you've been making to the code during development time, well, you can have fancy organized separation of concerns for your applications in their deployed state as well. So you no longer have one application to build and deploy. You have several individual applications that all do like a small thing each, but they work together, work with each other at runtime to form your actual complete application as far as your users are concerned. Now, what are the advantages of microservices? We've covered this. We have flexibility. Different teams can create and deploy microservices independently. They can put them on different servers or even build them in different languages or platforms. These microservices talk to each other through REST. So it really doesn't matter what language you actually use. You no longer have to use a common language or platform. What else? They can be scaled separately. Right? During the shopping traffic spikes, just scale whatever microservices are most used. The other microservices are unaffected. There are many more advantages, of course, but you also have to realize this opens up a whole lot of questions. For all the advantages that, that microservices have, they also have some problems as well. Earlier, you were dealing with one application. Now you're dealing with tens or maybe hundreds of mini applications in the form of microservices. So you need to make sure you're not making things worse in general, okay? So you're separating your application into microservices. What does this separation look like? How do you ideally split your application up into microservices? So for example, for every feature you need to add to your application, if you need to make changes to 10 different microservices, it kind of defeats the purpose. So you need to separate these applications well. Then there's a problem of how to make sure your microservices discover each other. On a single machine, on a monolith, it's fairly obvious how services call each other. But with microservices, how do the services know which REST API endpoints to call in which environment? Do you hard code these URLs? Or do you have a process around service discovery? So there are a whole lot of questions here that needs to be answered. And this in a nutshell is the whole thing about microservice architecture. Answering and solving for these problems is exactly what microservice architecture is all about. And it's a science of its own and it's even an art of its own. Before we wrap up this video though, I should clarify that there isn't a right or a wrong way to do these things. In fact, not all applications need to be architected as microservices, no matter how buzzworthy the term is right now. There are many applications that should be built with monolithic architectures. Please don't believe that microservices are somehow better than monolithic applications. They're just different, and both approaches have their own pros and cons. 
I hope this video gave you some ideas about microservices, why they were introduced, why they're so popular, and what they're actually all about. Thank you for watching.